We're in budget development season now, and uh, given the continuing and compounding impact of legislation known as S2, which we've talked about relentlessly uh, over the last five years, we move into year six, and that's followed by year seven. Um, you know, the district has lost a, a great deal of funding and in preparation for some of the difficult decisions that lie ahead of us in the, the years to come. One area, given the, the scale of uh, the loss of state aid, one of the areas that we, we knew we needed to consider was transportation services to the district. So, uh, at the beginning of, of this school year, we issued a request for proposal. Uh, we received proposals, evaluated them, and ultimately engaged Ross Haber Associates to perform a certain scope of work that includes looking very closely at our existing operation and then also modeling out for us what changes would look like under legislation and under certain conditions um, and for the board's consideration in finalizing the budget adoption. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Ross Haber and Tim Ammon uh, to uh, present and provide an update on the status of their work so far. So, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, members of the board, Dr. Simpson, uh, Mr. Boyce. Appreciate the opportunity to come here and present the preliminary aspects of our um, analyses that have been conducted to date around transportation concerns and, and options that may exist from, a, from an evaluating transportation standpoint. Um, what we want to be able to do tonight is to take you through uh, the work that's been completed to date, including some assessment of, of options from both an operational and from a financial perspective. Um, so uh, I think as, as Sean had mentioned, the scope of work that we have undertaken has essentially three components to it. The first is to review the costs of transportation um, in, in terms of both their magnitude and the sources, in identifying what are the drivers, uh, pardon the point, I suppose, of transportation-related costs, uh, and then to, within the scope of transportation services, to look at um, which services are required to be provided versus which services are being provided either electively or um, are being provided as a matter of choice. And then finally, to, to think about what the range of options might be in terms of looking at the, the scope of transportation services and how we may be able to assess demand and, and changes to cost that would come to changes in the way that we provide transportation services. And so, just to provide everybody a baseline, I realize that, that's, uh, that it's a little bit small for people to see, but, but if we look at transportation, um, it's an approximately $24 million business, um, of which we are looking at um, industry costs of approximately $10 million and, and all other contracted costs of about $14 million. And within that scope, um, we're transporting about 11,000 kids using about 400 routes and 270 buses. So one of the things that we see is, and this is certainly a positive and, and reflective of, of well considerations within the transportation operation, um, is that there are a number of logistical strategies that are in place where what we are trying to do, just by looking at 400 routes and 270 buses, it means that some portion of the buses are being used more than once, right? To accomplish multiple missions, uh, a logistical process called tiering, which, which we're in favor of, um, in addition, there is a range of, of schools that are combined where we're transporting students from multiple schools at the same time, which is a logistical strategy called combination runs, something else that, that uh, is used to try to drive efficiency into the system. So those two things certainly are reflective of efforts on the part of the transportation operation to make efficient use of the resources. Um, in doing that, one of the things that we'll talk about here is from a transportation efficiency standpoint, uh, a key consideration that we have, particularly here, um, is what proportion of the seats that are available to us are we filling with students from a plan basis um, and on an actual basis. And one of the things that we see is on an overall value, uh, we see seven out of 10 seats being full. And that, from our perspective, having done hundreds of these studies across the country, 
um, that, that is a, an efficiently designed structure. A anything in the anything in the 60s is actually pretty efficient. Um, in, in the 70s, actually represents a, a, a strong degree of efficiency. And what we see is when we break this down in some of the component parts of the operation, um, we see that the industry routes are actually almost closer to 80, which is really really well thought out in terms of the uh, the use of planned seating capacity. Um, in some of the contracted routes, the values are lower, but that is because in a number of instances, the contracted routes are servicing kids who are attending schools outside of their own boundaries, um, which, as you can imagine, just given the time to travel and so forth, um, it, it creates some inefficiency in the system that, that results in lower, lower capacity use. And, and as we start to think about what options might be available, one of the things that, that we'll talk about here is you know, transportation is essentially a time and distance problem. And if we have schools that are starting at relatively near times, it makes it very difficult for us to reuse assets, which requires, in the end, more assets. So when we think about drivers of transportation costs, one of the things that we think about is how many seats are full and how much, how much time do we have to fill those seats. And given that the, the, the distance between the schools and the, the relative uh, closeness of bell times and accomplishing multiple missions is a challenge. So, so we have to be highly focused on our use of the seats as, as a measure of efficiency. Um, and, and one of the things that, that we have looked at here is to try to understand how is this all being accomplished from an administrative and a managerial perspective. And when we look at, at the personnel cost structure as, as part of the makeup of the transportation costs, the way your organization is designed, the way that it's aligned, and the overall cost is within the guidelines of what we would expect to see in an operation of this size and complexity. Um, and so what we don't believe is that there's a, a significant amount of administrative inefficiency that can just get immediately squeezed out of the system. So the, from a personnel perspective, um, we don't see big reductions in personnel costs in the transportation management component of things as a as a viable strategy to achieving uh, significant significant transportation. So when we think about transportation, ultimately what we have to try to do is to address this question of how do we meaningfully reduce transportation costs? But when we're doing that, there are a number of considerations that Ross and I take into consideration when we're thinking about this. Um, clearly, we're in the business of thinking about safety. How do we safely transport students? Um, but in addition, we're in, when we look at options, one of the things that we're trying to ensure is that whatever we come up with, students who are in similar situations are being treated similarly, right? So that's the consistency of the application of, of services across the entire district. So that, is, that becomes a factor in terms of how we look at what options might be available uh, for changes to the, either the methodology or the structure of, of transportation. And then lastly, what we want to try to do is, and this, this points to one of the, the notes that John made in his opening comments, um, this is, because this is not a single year problem, one of the things that we are focused on is what strategies can we undertake that would allow for persistent savings over time? Right? So how are we making meaningful reductions and, and retaining those savings over time, recognizing that we have annual changes in cost as a consequence of inflation and, and the way that where the, the distribution of the kids and everything else. So, so a, so a big consideration for us is um, over what period of time do we think these savings can be, can be retained. So in looking at it, in essence what we, what we see are two separate models in terms of options for, for reducing transportation costs. The first is, is a set of targeted changes, and in the end that is changes to how we are actually providing transportation in the car. So, not significant changes to the structure, but maybe maybe inefficient, inefficiencies that we can squeeze out of the system that result in some cost reduction uh, to, to the overall scope of transportation services. And then the second option is thinking about demand reduction. And when we think about demand reduction, that's really changes to who actually receives transportation. So who's eligible and who receives transportation services. And we'll, we'll talk about what we think some of the options are in both of those rooms uh, as we get a little further downstream. When, 
when we think about that $24 million in transportation cost, so one of the things that we have to realize, and we mentioned this a little bit at the beginning in terms of the scope, is there are certain services that are that are either mandated or required um, that are going to limit our ability to assume that that full $24 million is available in order to take costs out of the system. When we look at, at special needs transportation requirements, particularly um, requirements that are identified as part of the or or part of 504 plans or whatever it might be, our options to reduce those services are different than they are for general ed students, as, as I think you're all aware. Um, and so that puts that puts a bit of a call around how much of that $24 million we can we can actually look to try to take savings out of. And the same thing happens with even though it's a, just a, a more limited population, homeless students, foster care, those kinds of uh, services that have particularly under both special needs and homeless and foster care um, have federal mandates associated with them um, that, that do place pretty significant limitations on on our ability to change the way services are being provided. Uh, and when we look at the cost of services as they exist right now, that represents about 30% of that $24 million. So, so in the end, what we're talking about is, just to make math a little bit easier, um, it is roughly $16 million of that $24 million. Okay? So when we think about the basics of trying to save transportation costs, right, and this is like the easiest sort of transportation one on one you can have, Right, there's basically two goals that we have to have. The first one is, and we're doing this here in the district, is we have to try to fill the bus to the greatest extent possible. Right? These are the things that drive efficiency. If we're using as many seats as we possibly can, um, that gives us the opportunity to be efficient in the use of capacity. And then we want to try to reuse that same asset as many times as possible. Right? Because then it's, that is essentially allowing us to take that 54 passenger asset for the sake of argument, and if we use it three times, it's really 162 passenger asset, right? So, so that's where the time component of things becomes an aspect of this. So when we think about transportation, the, the mantra that we provide to folks when we, are, when we are looking for efficiencies is, what can we do to fill it and what can we do to reuse it? And anything that we're doing to impede either one of those is going to drive inef inef inefficiency into the system and more than likely end up costing us money in some way. So, so the nature of what we're looking for is opportunities to do both of these when we are looking at cost savings. So as we mentioned, there's sort of two categories of, of cost savings that we think are available. The first is the set of targeted opportunities, which we have estimated to be approximately a million dollars. Um, and they are from taking some inefficiency out of the current system. So there are, as we mentioned, there are high rates of capacity across the system. Um, but that doesn't mean that every individual route has a high rate of capacity. So we think there are some opportunities to look at individual routes to, to try to tune up some of the routing there and, and gain some efficiencies through a reduction of assets that way. Um, but what we, what we know is there is not a significant amount of time for us to work with. So the fact that we might be able to do a little bit better job of, re, of filling the asset we still don't have a lot of opportunities to reuse the asset without pretty significant changes in bell times. So from the possibility of savings from this, again, it just becomes more supplemental to the services than, than if we were to look at some of the demand reduction strategies that we'll talk about here in, in a couple of minutes. And we have another challenge, which is, um, as you have all well experienced over the last few years, the driver shortage that exists out there um, has actually forced us to take many of the efficiencies that we would have otherwise had because there just aren't enough butts to be in enough seats to get kids to school, right? So, so the challenge of where, it, it is a, um, and this is a weird thing from a consultant to say, but like it's really too bad that you guys are efficient, right? Because if we were inefficient, we'd have a lot more opportunities to save money. But the driver shortage and the way that your folks have been managing the system have driven efficiency into the system, so it has a, the effect of, of limiting some of the savings that we might otherwise achieve. And, and you know, there are certain things that we can do when we look at this, which is including things like looking at stop consolidation, so there's larger groups of students at individual stop locations, which has the effect of being able to speed routes up some, because we're not stopping as many times. Again, thinking about transportation as a time and distance problem. Um, but, but the ability to do that if we can't pair schools together because of the bell time structure, we only have a limited amount of 
that that's going to that that's going to create that may improve service a little bit, but it's not going to it's not going to result in, in substantial cost reductions. So we do want to try to take advantage of these when we can. But one of the things that we have to recognize is that from a strategic perspective, the targeted opportunities will be supplemental to when we change the nature of how we provide services. When we think about demand reduction as an issue, uh, ultimately what we're saying here is, who's eligible for service? Right? Currently, essentially, all students are eligible for, for services. And, and one of the things that we are looking at is if we start from the standpoint of state guidelines, which is two and a half miles for high school students, and use that as, as, the, first, as the first tranche of, of uh, changes in demand that we might, that we might make, what does that mean in terms of changing the number of students that are eligible for services and consequently the number of buses we need and then therefore ultimately the costs that we may incur. Right? So that's uh, when we are looking at demand reduction, that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at the number of kids who we might be transporting and by changing the number of kids who are eligible. So in order to think about that, one of the things that we want to be able to do and that Ross will take you through here now is to just talk some about how from an individual school level, changes in demand might look if we start at two and a half miles and, and, and think about some of the other changes that, that may be possible. Okay, so what you look excuse me, what you're looking at are the current attendance zones for each of the regional high schools. These are the actual attendance zones. And what we want you to take a look at throughout this process is not only how many kids go to the school, but how many kids actually attend schools that are outside of their home attendance zone. So again, those are, um, those are the attendance maps. We will provide you with maps with detail and things like that that you can use them in on. Uh, and uh, it, it took us, I would say, a good six weeks to be able to run down these attendance zones. Um, but we have them now, and it was really helpful in the process. So what we're looking at now is, um, is the Colts Neck attendance zone. Those turquoise lines represent distances from this school, walk distances from the school. The outer circle is two and a half miles. The next circle in is two miles. Circle in after that is one and a half miles. And then the final circle is one mile. And what we're doing through this process is calculating the total number of students who would be eligible at these different mileage levels. Now it's a little hard to see, but those black dots on the outside are showing the total number of students who reside out who attend Colts Neck High School, who reside outside the school, outside of the attend, actual attending zone. Those are general ed students, special ed and vocational ed students are not in these calculations. So these are the total number of, of, of kids in the zone, the black dots, and kids outside of the zone, the pink being the zone. One kid. Each one represents one kid. So if you take a look, this would be, this is Freehold Borough High School. This is Freehold, yeah. It's Freehold Borough High School, part of the map. Yeah. Because you're not, because you're not getting the scope of the number of kids, it's cut, it's cut off. Right. So, I'm sorry. Okay. So let's Ross. And I think as we go through these maps, the, the the message is where are the concentrations of kids relative yeah. to the attendance zone? Um, because we know all of the black dots are where the kids live, right? Yes. And all of those kids go in this case, Field Township High School, but. Uh, we're not going to be counting the black dots on this map, but you can see where the heavy concentration of kids is relative to the circles representing the distances from schools. Exactly. Okay, so this is how high school, and again, the distribution um, based on the mileages and the locations of the students. Um, in Alpin High School, again, same kind of thing. Okay, sure. So again, you can see what the densities are yeah. on, on these maps. It's kind of a light. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, this is Manalpin High School, and 
And this Marlboro High School, you see again the densities and the distances outside the zone. Okay. And do you want to take this? So, so that, I think that the, what we're trying to what we were trying to do with the maps is to give a sense of within those concentric rings how many students would we need to transport. And what we can see is, and again, what we have done in order to make some cost estimates is we've done two things. We've estimated the number of students who would be eligible for services. We've made an assumption about how many students we could put on a bus. So for a 54 passenger bus, we've assumed 60 students because we know some high school students aren't going to ride. And so we, we have a strategy already of overloading buses. So that's consistent with what we're doing now. Um, and then in order to come up with two values, the first being what is the net change in the number of resources required, we take the number of, of eligible students and divide them by 60. And that gives us a sense of, of the number of buses that we're going to require. Um, and so as you can see, just at two and a half miles from across the system, we have roughly 6,500 students who are eligible, um, which would require 108 buses. We are currently using for those same groups of students 168 buses, so we have an actual net reduction in the number of assets of 60. And then in order to determine what the cost might be, one of the things that we did is to take existing costs of a 54 passenger asset as the representative vehicle for this, um, and to, to think about what was the median cost of that asset right now, and what is the likely change in that cost for next year as a, as a result of because one of the things that we all want to be con considerate of is inflationary costs over the last two years and probably in the next two years coming are significantly different than the inflationary costs that we have occurred in the years prior. Right? So one, one of the adjustments that we wanted to use is to use a, a different, is to ensure that we were accounting for that inflationary value um, of, of the cost of the contracts. And so at that point it becomes a math problem, right? We have a the number of buses that we might reduce times what we project the cost to be to provide us with what the projected potential savings are. And what you can see in the distribution is at each of the tranches that we that we spoke about, the mile, mile and a half, two and two and a half, um, you can see the individual values. But then what, what is, I think, more illuminating is the change in values between the tranches. So if we look at the difference between a mile and a mile and a half, we have in the neighborhood of a $900,000 difference. If we look at the difference between two miles and two and a half miles, we have in the neighborhood of a million four difference. Right? So, and, and keep in mind, these are these end up being cumulative savings, right? Because if we go to a mile and a half, that includes the mile counts. Right? So, so the challenge here is to is to be thinking about at each of these different tranches, how does eligibility change, and consequently, how does the potential cost? And, and what we see, again, is, is the notable difference um, at the outer ring at two and a half miles. It's a 3,600 students that would not have. It's 108 buses that would be required. Uh, 3,600. Yes. Uh, of the general ed students that are included. Because again, we've, for purposes of this assessment, we've removed special needs students, we've removed vocational students for, for purposes of this first part of the So, like, And, and, and again, what we can see, and I'll take it just through the columns just to make sure, this is the number, of, these are the, the number of students that we would be planning transportation for. This is the number of students that would no longer be eligible. This is the number of buses that we are projecting would be required, which is this number divided by 60. The net change is 168 minus whatever the, this number is, right? And it's surrounding, right? Because we have 3,600 uh, we can, yeah, we don't have it here. Um, and then, and then, obviously, the math is this is this times this equals that. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things that we have not done here, this is purely a, a, 
an, an exercise in understanding very strict lines of eligibility. So we have not, in this, in this analysis, considered anything for hazardous transportation or anything like that. This is purely our, if you're inside or outside that line, you're eligible or you're not. No hazardous is considered in this at, 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 as of right now. Special ed is taken out. Correct. So when we think about it, one of the one of the consequences of this, and one of the things that we have been looking at, um, other questions on this just before I before I move on. Um, one of the things that we have been looking at is is the question of out of district vocational students. Um, I think as Ross was pointing out in the other maps, one of the things that we see here is you see this enormous buckshot distribution of students across uh, across the district going to various schools, which from a logistics standpoint is not super, right? It's really hard for us to fill and reuse the bus, the bus when we've got um, low density services that we're trying to provide. So when we're looking at um, this, this group of approximately 600 students going to these five schools, one of the things that we're thinking about is, is what's the way to try to address, what's the impact of this pattern in particular, this low density pattern, on um, the overall cost of transportation services and what, what we might be do about changing it. Um, when we look at it and break it down into more detail, one of the things that we see, if you remember, an inflation adjusted value of $61,000 overall on the industry costs. When we look at these services in particular, we see a median value of $80,000 per grade. Right? So we've got some very high cost routes that are associated with this kind of a service. So when we look at the 41 routes in total, we have in a neighborhood of $3.2 million in costs associated with it. And when we look at it on a cost per rider basis, right, which is one of the key efficiency statistics that we look at from a transportation standpoint. Um, cost per rider here is about $6,000 a student um, versus industry services where it's about $1,000 a student. Right? So that 6x factor is not, it's not unexpected. Um, when we see low density services, low density services are typically, you know, four, six, eight times um, as much as, as traditional in-district higher density services. So, so that number, that number is not surprising from a, from a ratio standpoint, it's just, it can be surprising that it's that much more expensive on a per unit basis to transport these students. And when we look at any kind of demand reduction, if, if we look at anything other than demand reduction for them, what I mean is, is when we look at route services, this is really where some of the targeted savings opportunities might exist. If we were to make revisions to routes or consolidations to routes, um, there are some opportunities here. Um, one of the things that we see is all these services have uh, multiple routes servicing the school. Um, and if we look, one of the things that they have is they have comparatively very low passive use, right? We mentioned 69% overall. In these services in particular, it's only 35%. So if you think about, you know, if we round up for the sake of argument, that's four out of every 10 seats filled instead of seven out of every 10, right? So, so that's the impact of low density. The impact of low density is that dramatic reduction in, in capacity use. Um, and so one of the things that we would have to think about is how can we either speed up the routes or, or create time in order to try to better use these assets. Um, what we think is through some of these targeted strategies, there's probably an opportunity within this group without doing any, without doing any major changes to demand um, of a five to eight bus reduction. So if we're thinking about it on a median value that has again been adjusted for inflation, um, we're talking in the neighborhood of you know four hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars in cost change. Um, and, and where we think there might be some other opportunities, assumptions that we haven't made into this analysis as of yet, is doing is changing at a material level uh, the length of student rides or any of those kind of other things. You know, we've kept them all in the ballpark of where they are now. Um, and if we were to do, if we were to do that, there would become a greater opportunity to try to achieve some savings within this group of students. So we change the route, that would save. Could, 
staggered some, but I can tell you that the vocational bus routes are single tier routes, which also adds to the inefficiency of it, right? So our high schools, three on one tier and three on the next tier, so one bus has two runs within its, its, its work for any given day. Um, but it, when, we were, when we were looking at each of the individual schools and the maps, just to get a sense of the density of the students within those rings, um, the shaded area was the attendance area for that particular school that we were looking at. For voc vocational students, the shaded area would be the entire district, right? So it's a 200 square mile footprint. So it, it's a huge footprint. I think Buckshot is, is a good description of they could be anywhere, right? Um, so with such a, a low efficiency standard, with only a single use of the bus, and not being able to fill buses to capacity because then we would be looking at a, a two and a half, three hour bus ride to school, right? Because it's gonna have to cover a lot more ground to pick up enough students to fill a, a, a bus up, right? So those are some of the specific challenges with the vocational school district. Also, I just want to mention, even within your trip home, there's less students in the buses, especially if they're doing activities in the setting so, uh, and I, right, so, and, and I think Tim may have a bullet, and Tim and Ross have a bullet point on that, but I'll, I'll, I'll jump them on that. Um, really across the district, right, the utilization of our buses in the afternoon is far less than in the morning. However, there's no way to isolate that, you know, and have morning bus runs and, and, and afternoon bus runs. Uh, there would be, but the logistics of that would be overwhelming and, in all likelihood, potentially more expensive. It very much changed the relationship that you have with the, with the contractors. Right, because... In your own staff. Right. Um, I mean, the same bus runs that are happening in the morning would need to cover the same area because it could be any, any kit. So it needs to be ready to hit every bus stop as it did in the morning on the way. So, so as we think about the structure of the, of the choice and the choices that need to be made, um, one of the things that we clearly are trying to recognize here is ultimately the, the level of impact is, is going to be dependent on, on the degree of cost savings that we need and, and how long we want to maintain those savings. Right? So that, that ultimately becomes part of the discussion in terms of, of refining and identifying what, um, what the actual savings might be from this. Um, one of the things that is clear is again transportation is essentially a demand and supply problem also um, changes in demand are going to have notably more impact than the targeted changes they work well together and the targeted changes can be very useful very, very useful as a supplement um, but significant dollar savings i think as you've seen through the tables um, are get achieved through changes in demand they don't, they don't the, the same savings are not available just through changes in some of the targeted services. So when we think about some of those considerations, I mean, obviously these things um, have a whole web of things to be considered, um, but we, one of the things that we know is changes in demand are, are likely to impact the district at large. Um, virtually all students will be impacted in some way um, because we have to, when we're thinking about uh, essentially moving to something other than the existing eligibility model, Right, there are ripple effects that will occur across the district. We will also have to have considerations around this question of hazard services and, and the design and development of hazard services. Uh, having a policy around it, uh, if, if the district chooses to provide for hazard transportation, the development of the policy and the, and the structure of that policy is something uh, that's going to have to get considered. In addition, one of the things that will become evident as we start to think about uh, the design of a, of a hazard program, uh, hazard identification, is that it's going to have some impact on potential savings. Because we're going to essentially be taking some of those students and putting them back in the, back in the pool, um, which, will, which will reduce the savings that are projected as they are right now. And then we'll have other considerations to the degree that um, this isn't something that's happening already, but we just have parking and traffic concerns around the schools um, in terms of getting in and, and, and for students who may be driving, um, what the options are available for there. And, and then lastly, what other options might be available for 
mitigating the loss of service. Uh, one of the things that's available here in the state is a set of subscription services, right, where, where you can, as a parent, you can pay for the ride. Um, and that structure can be uh, done in a, in a multitude of different ways. But what we know is the degree to which we allow for subscription services if we're going to guarantee those services, meaning it doesn't matter if one student signs up or 50 students signs up, we're gonna apply a bus to this. Um, there is likely to be some subsidization of that service that's going to be required, and that consequently has an effect on the potential savings that we might have. And then lastly, I think, and, and this is something that is ongoing, obviously, in the department, um, but, but is, is just a reminder that we're gonna have to continue to look for, um, is looking at opportunities to create time in the system, whether that's through changes to bell times, whether that's changes to arrival and drop-off times, whatever it might be, um, that allow for those continuing efficiency efforts uh, and, uh, and our ability to try to pursue those as additional supplemental savings to whatever is um, ultimately determined to be based on the structure of, of the system as it's designed. So uh, a, a few comments. Um, Tim and Ross um, on, on the presentation, and then uh, we'll go to board members uh, with any questions or comments that they may have, and, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, when we went through the maps of the schools, right, so the schools are going to be impacted, impacted differently depending on you know, where they live in relation to the, the circle that's going to be deemed ineligible. Um, and that's just simply a matter of the geography of it. So, but I can tell you that um, Colts Neck and Howell uh, are the least impacted based on where their students currently reside. Freehold Borough is the most impacted based on where students reside. Freehold Township, Manalapin, and Marlboro are somewhere in between. I would characterize them as all significantly impacted, right? So, you know, at, at the two and a half mile, um, that's a third of our kids. That's a third of our students that would be impacted. But something that was said, and, and I want to emphasize that, is that all students um, are potentially impacted by this. It's, it's not a matter of simply, if you're outside of that and eligible for transportation, then it's business as usual because the supplemental group, right, so there's the demand reduction and that's, that's where the meat of the savings are, but the supplemental group is also about efficiencies and, and think of it, um, in, in, it, it has an impact in different ways, but one of the su substantial ways would be um, if we consolidate bus stops to come to the top of the neighborhood, right? That means that that bus is less time on the road dropping into the neighborhoods into several bus stops, right? So there's some efficiency there with fuel and whatnot, but it's really a time thing. It's more of a time thing. And where we have runs, uh, bus runs that are not being filled to capacity, that savings of time allows us additional time to continue and, and, and get to additional kids and therefore bring up our capacity. So, and we'll do that where it makes sense. Um, where we can do that safely and where it makes sense. Um, the, the number up there for the demand response at the maximum of two and a half miles, 3.7 million roughly, um, that is at you know, the, the pure, most hardcore form of it, right? That's it's, it's, as at two and a half miles, if you're in, then you don't, you're not eligible, and if you're out, you are eligible. And districts have, there's a, there's a whole range of degrees of implementation of this. Our thinking at this point is, and this is regarding hazardous routes, right, is that as we design routes as a result of the decisions that are made, um, we are going to identify some areas that are, are hazardous, and I'll use the obvious example of, I'm not gonna have a kid cross Route 9, right? Uh, I'm not, I'm, that, that's an obvious one that that's a hazardous area. And there are others, right? And, um, and we'll make those decisions and we'll bake that into the root development. But in addition to that, it's something that we can use going forward, is to come up with a set of criteria. Uh, and there are plenty of examples out there of district point systems of what's the speed limit on the road, is the distance, or what's the, are there sidewalks, right? And the, are they walking against traffic? So there are a bunch of criteria that 
uh, if any parent requests a review, we'll have an objective mechanism to go through and score that situation, and then the, that'll be the determination. You know, um, the, the idea of safety, and we all know this, is, is subjective. It, it's heavily subjective, right? I can tell you uh, my wife's idea of what's safe and what, what my idea of what's safe is, is different, vastly different, okay? So, and that's, that's just in one house. Uh, so, but I think it's important that we have an objective measure really for the administration of the policy that we're going to use uh, so that the transportation department has something to hang their hat on, right? So that, that'll be a separate um, discussion sort of post and, and that'll be reviewed by the board and approved by the board and that's what, and, it, and it'll be reviewed annually by the board and, and either tweaked or, or um, just reinstated for the following year. Um, so as we move through this, there'll be some growing pains. Um, some of my other thoughts here, um, the, the, the fill it or use it, and as we talked about it, we talked about it in the vocational context, but it's also true in um, the context of the kids that attend our schools that may live outside of that school's particular attendance area, right? The, the colored section of that particular map. Um, we, we still have some of those same challenges there where those, those students can come from anywhere across the district to make their way in. So although they will be outside, many of them will be outside of the two and a half miles, um, they'll also see, we see some opportunities for stop consolidation and some savings to supplement our main demand response saving there as well. Um, uh, the, the, the other important piece to this is that we will work closely with the six police departments um, that host our six high schools um, in terms of, you know, a review of safety conditions. Um, and I know that many districts work closely with their police departments on this. They'll also be helpful in helping guide us on traffic control at the school, right? Because if, if, if courtesy busing is um, diminished to some extent, then there's going to be a lot more traffic in front of the school, right? And that's something else that we have to think about and plan about and work with our police departments on. 